writing a book because I thought that's what Isabel may have wanted me to do. And I don't know if you picked up recently, but there's been quite a lot of repeats of Bernard Levin's of clever, clever observation to someone who said, um, I've got a book in me. And Levin said, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear, how pathetic to say you've got a book in you. It's a bit like a carpenter saying he's got a wardrobe in him. Well, I thought, clever though that is, I'm actually on the side of the person who said she or he had got a book in them. Because the, all of us think that, or many of us think that. And we we want to say something either for our children or for posterity or whatever else it may be. And fine, we can't do it. And my hard drive, if I've got it still, is littered with documents that are the beginnings of books that never got anywhere past about the first two pages, because I just didn't have the skills, still don't probably. So how did this book get written? Well, uh, my life's a bit of a drift. I just let things happen and then get disappointed when they stop happening. But at one stage, somebody said to me, why don't you apply to be an aggression professor of law? which seemed to me a nonsensical idea because I'm not clever enough to be a professor of anything. But she pressed, and so I put the application in in the last half an hour and I got the job. I suppose it had been fixed somewhere. Um, and that required me to present eventually 24 public lectures, um, an hour long each. And for any of you who've been to Gresham will know about it. When the audience leaves, they have to be presented with a printed version of your lecture. Good gosh. Now, here am I, someone who always thought it was better to be either off the cuff or to pretend to be off the cuff without notes and, in fact, having prepared the thing for months beforehand. And here I was expected to write something down and to read from it and to read from it in exactly 50 minutes. And I found it really, really difficult. Normally, I landed up with about 30 or 40 pages of stuff that had to be reduced to about 10 sides at 1.5, whatever it is, spacing. And so it was hard work. I learned about it, and there the lectures were. And then somebody said, why don't you put them in a book? And so I did, and that had a really, I had a really good editor who was very firm with me, and I think she did as good a job as could possibly be done given the limitations of the material she had. Now, the book, remember that we all like to, we all like to leave something for our children and grandchildren in case they might want to read it. So I wanted to smuggle in a bit of autobiography. And so there's a little bit at the beginning in the preface and in the postscript. But autobiography in books is really boring if what you decide is that the, that the writer is really trying to keep talking, me, 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 me. And you shouldn't put in autobiographical stuff unless it's strictly relevant to the subject matter about which you're writing. And so you'll find in the book, if you have a look at it ever, that <laughs> apart from the preface and postscript, it only, autobiography doesn't turn up very much, but it does turn up of great importance in the two appendices, and I'll come to those in a minute. But as to the rest of the material, it's a difficult book with, I can't remember, 17 of the <coughs> 24 lectures I gave cut down in size. And so... Let me talk a bit about some of those, because as you've been told, I was an ordinary old lawyer and then landed up entirely by chance in accordance with the, my usual approach of drift, uh, uh, prosecuting at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia um, for the United Nations. Well, we don't have time to go into the detail of that, but looking at you as I now can, I guess most of you will remember the former Yugoslavia and we'll probably have some recollection, detailed or slight, it doesn't matter, of the, of the three wars, three proper wars that occurred there uh, in three of the former six uh, constituent republics or regions. That's the three big wars. There was another small one. And th they fell for prosecution. And I did one prosecution, a couple of prosecutions, and then eventually I came back to do Milosevic. Now, what's really important to me as a message to give to people who aren't involved in these things <coughs> is that, of course, the system was corrupt. It's a horrible thing to say, but of course it was corrupt. It was corrupt in a number of ways, but it was mostly corrupt in a way that mattered to me because big politics 
would get involved in international war crimes trials and was always bound to. And I used to get rather prissy about it and think, oh, how wrong for a government to interfere with evidence uh, in what should be a legal process and should be as pure as, as snow and so on. But actually, of, of course, governments should get involved and of course they should try and corrupt legal proceedings because their interest is not the interest of the court. Any diplomat's interest is to safeguard the reputation of his or her nation state. And if they have a way of doing that and it involves interfering with the process of justice, I'm afraid inevitably the nation state's interest will, you may even say, should trump the interest of the court. It's a horrible thing to say, but it's quite important for a reason I'll come to a little later on when perhaps I have time to talk about Russia, Ukraine. But I'll just give you one example of the very worst, the worst example, really, of the political interference that I experienced in the um, the trial against Milosevic. Um, without a map, you'll remember vaguely that Serbia is up here and Bosnia is there. And Serbia was never at war. Um, but there was a war going on in Bosnia between the three involved parties, the Bosnian Serbs, the Bosnian Muslims and the Bosnian Croats, each of which group was unhappy about living with or being ruled by another group. And the Bosnian Serbs carved out as majority areas by killing lots of people and then driving lots of people out. They created Serb majority areas in Bosnia in the hope ultimately of joining them together and then joining them to Serbia. And at the end of this horrible period of what's called ethnic cleansing and might even be called genocide, um, there were three uh, uh, towns left, enclaves less, Srebrenica, Zepa and Gorazda, which were in Serb dominated territory on the east, sorry, on the east of Bosnia, and that the United Nations could do nothing to defend or protect or help or anything else. And what happened was, so far as Srebrenica is concerned, that there came a time when a man called Mladic, a general, invaded, killed lots of people, took over the town, divided the men and women, and then took all the men away and killed eight and a half thousand of them, men and boys. And so it was a really bad thing. It was the worst bit of... Um, war crimes since the Second World War. And by the way, it's still not resolved. Now, in the course of the trial, and this is something for you to think about, in the course of the trial, um, I became aware that uh, there were transcripts of telephone calls passing between Milosevic, who we said was a sort of mastermind up there in Serbia, out of the war, controlling the Bosnian Serbs in Bosnia. There were transcripts of the phone calls with him. And we knew from another document, which was completely you know, straight out of the Serbian archives, that he'd been in conversation with Mladic a few days after Srebrenica fell on the 11th of July, 1995. And we know roughly the subject matter of his discussion because he mentions it in a transcript. So obviously I tried to get the tape recordings. Why wouldn't I? And so I <coughs> wrote to the, sorry, I've got a terrible cold. Um, and I'll try not to cough too much. Um, we wrote to the five countries concerned that we thought would inevitably have the transcripts. Three of them said they didn't have it. One of those was the British government, but I didn't believe what I was told, but there we are. America never gave an answer. And the last country, Canada, didn't give an answer, but said sufficiently little that I could get them to the court to say to the judges, we have or we haven't got these tape recordings and you can or cannot have them for security or other reasons. And Canada indeed was in The Hague, waiting to give evidence and furious with me, so I've been told when the American embassy walked into my boss, the chief prosecutor, a woman called Del Ponte, and simply instructed her 
to stop this part of the investigation. And since I was in a line management position, although I'm an English barrister, I had to do what I was told. In fact, I don't think she even bothered to tell me. She went to the court and withdrew the application to get the transcripts from Canada. Shocking, very shocking. I, and I don't think, if you read my excuse for this in Appendix 1 of <coughs> the book, because Appendix 1 has an, a summary of all the political interferences in the trial that happened, and I, I sort of acquit myself, but I don't think I was right to do so. I think really I should have done more than I did. That's another story, maybe. But uh, I, I pressed on with the case. You can't, you know, you can't stop. Your, these cases are so big and decisions day after day after day. And I thought, well, why has America done that? Why has it stopped me getting this evidence which might have shown? Hello, yes, Martin. Oh, I thought you were you were only getting a glass, not uh, not asking to speak. Sorry, quite right. <laughs> I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, so I thought I thought that they were trying to keep this evidence from me because it would show how much they knew. Years later, in 2014, Clinton, President Clinton's library released for no very good, with no very good reasoning a clutch of materials that shows something rather different and much more sinister. Because it showed that the State Department of America on the 28th of May of 1995, so six weeks before Srebrenica was uh, attacked, taken over, and the 8,000 men were the subject of killings, had come to an agreement not to defend Srebrenica. But the agreement was what was called quiet. And what was meant by quiet was that the US, Britain and France, and I think Germany, were parties to the agreement. The Dutch who were trying to defend Srebrenica were kept out of the agreement, as were the Bosnian Muslims. And so on the 10th of July, uh, when there was a request for firepower to save them and when the places where the firepower could have gone in order to stop those eight and a half thousand people being taken away and murdered, the promise came from uh, probably from General Janvier, the Frenchman, that yes, 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 you'll have the planes tomorrow morning. None came and the crimes were committed. And so it's highly probable, and I'm yet produce, pursuing this, even, even at this stage of my life, I'm still pursuing this to try and get at the truth. It is at least possible, if not probable, that the reason America and Great Britain, and I'll come to Great Britain, interfered with this investigation was because they didn't want it to be tracked back to what happened on the 28th of May when a decision, a secret decision was made not to defend Srebrenica. And you can imagine what might have happened in the conversations. We only have a, a, a printed version of Milosevic saying, you'll, you'll remember I had a conversation with you about this. And he says that to someone else. But supposing the conversation had said there are two alternatives. Look here, Mladic, do whatever, uh, be, be careful what you do with the, uh, with the people you've got. Put them on, a, on the bus, give them a bottle of water, remember the Geneva Conventions, don't do anything bad. Then he would have been not guilty. But if he'd said, look, it's all right, you can do what the hell you like with them. If he'd even gone even further and said, you can do what you ha the hell you like with them, because I I've been told that by Mr. X. How much different would that be? So the hard evidence is that there was an agreement, which could be embarrassing, which was not known about by me or anyone else when I was conducting the trial, and that the evidence was suppressed. <laughs> when I say England was involved, I forgot all about this until a few a couple of years ago, three years ago probably now, I was looking at some old emails I had from that time and I bumped into one I'd forgotten about. And it was an email to the military attache, sorry, the legal attache to the British embassy in The Hague, a young chap. And I tore him off the most terrible strip in writing for having come into my office apparently and tried to support the Americans and told me how dare I interfere with the Americans 
and ordering me, ordering me to tell him what I was doing with the case. The complete breach of, a I don't know how many different legal rules. Would you like to know who the, who, who the legal attache was? I bet you would, because he's the name you'll all know, Dominic Raab. So this is what happens in the real world of international courts. And when I came back to my opening observation, maybe they're right. Maybe they, they should stick up for their reputations. Maybe they shouldn't put justice first. That's for you, the audience, to consider. So that's what happens, <clears throat> I don't mean tonight, but I mean generally the public audience has got to cope with this. And this is becoming very important because of Ukraine, Russia, and also to some extent with Israel, Gaza. So after uh, the, the Yugoslav tribunal, by which time the prosecutor who did everything that America wanted and a lot of things that Serbia wanted and hated my, hated me with a deep hatred. Um, I left immediately. I wouldn't have stayed in any event. There was no more work to be done. Milosevic was dead. He died before the end of the trial. And I got engaged in a few other things, some of which are covered in the book, some not. Um, but I landed up working in the International Criminal Court, which is the only international court for war crimes, which only covers part of the globe um, and certainly not America, Russia, uh, China, India, and places like that. And <coughs> so I worked for countries like Libya, Sudan, Kenya, Sri Lanka. I was on, now on the side of the bad boys just for a bit. And that was very, very interesting. But my life changed, really, because although I did that for to earn a living, I was approached regularly to do other things for good guys. And I, I found that a great deal more interesting, although, of course, you don't get paid for it. And so I found myself working one way or another for uh, victim groups of different kinds around the world, North Koreans, uh, 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 Myanmar, um, Rohingya, uh, for example. And one of the reasons for mentioning those names now is if you cast your minds back to the time where we got two big wars on, You'll remember that there was a time when uh, the Rohingya Muslims was the yes the Rohingya Muslim was really big news. We were shocked about it. Why aren't we doing something about it? And the same thing actually applied, if you can remember this far back, to those in the North Korean prisoner camps. It's very easy with the passage of time for us to forget all about these things, and we have done, because there's always been another and another and another. And so what eventually happened was. <laughs> I was asked to take part in something called a People's Tribunal. I had no idea what a People's Tribunal was. And when somebody explained to me what it was, I didn't think it was a remotely good idea because uh, it was exactly what it says it is, a tribunal of people. And the tribunal of people is doing that sort of thing, which really governments or international bodies should do, but which they don't do. And although I don't know whether I'm other than it, sorry, time for me to stop and for somebody else to say one of you is obviously moving around. Is, there, is any of you, I know Martin isn't, is any of you a lawyer? Any lawyers present? Shaking of heads. Good. No lawyers. No, no I don't mean good. I mean, no. We, we have no, one, Jeffrey. <laughs> Who's that? Me. That's myself. <laughs> myself, Shan. But I'm, I, I'm uh, 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 as you know, I'm a... Uh, trust litigation and real estate litigation lawyer rather than uh, in your field oh nevertheless it, uh, it's good to have somebody who might be a, a friend in need uh, but we'll see how we go from here so um the thing about these people's tribunals were that um they were just people they're supposed to be just people they started off um quite badly in a way because the the conflict that never got investigated uh, which should have been investigated, of course, was the Vietnam War. Nobody dared mess with uh, America, except um, Jean-Paul Sartre and Lord Bertrand Russell, who set up a tribunal to decide whether America had committed war crimes. Not such a good idea if you look at the combination of people they put on the tribunal, because they were all left-leaning communists or near-communists, and they weren't exactly regular, ordinary folk. But nevertheless, they started the idea that you could have a group of people dealing with 
um, these big issues that the, the world wouldn't deal with. And there's been no determination of the war crimes committed by America in Vietnam, although, of course, there undoubtedly were war crimes with carpet bombing, um, Agent Orange and all that sort of stuff. And so I was approached to, to be involved in one of these for Iran. <coughs> and in particular for what happened in Iran <coughs> in the 1980s when the Ayatollah Khomeini's opposition were being imprisoned because the war wasn't going so very well and he was polishing them off at a rate of knots. Um, they had trials in the prisons, uh, three, th three, part, three person trial panels and the, the questioning roughly went, you turn to Allah, if not, you were outside and you were hanged um, or disposed of in some even less pleasant way. And uh, this was a horrifying uh, narrative. And I was very skeptical about what good it could do. And that was a good thing for me because I started skeptically. I didn't start like, you know, a dog with two or three tails wagging away, thinking I found a, a new new toy to play with. Um, and as I, I sat through the first part of it, which was in London, I could begin to see the value. And I took a slightly bigger role in it in The Hague. Um, and I found it actually really quite moving. I have no emotions, generally speaking. There's, there's some kind of emotional blockage inside me. It never worried me the things I heard in the Yugoslav tribunal um, or come to that in domestic crime, really. But here, to see the diaspora of Iran, who really put this thing on, uh, affected and rewarded by seeing a proper pronouncement of what had happened to their loved ones, was I could see something of great value. And before I move on from the Iran tribunal, you'll be interested or pleased to know that the, the, the judges in that case, which was presided over by a retired uh, constitutional court judge of South Africa, so that's the equivalent of the Supreme Court, named a lot of people as members of these death committees. And one of them was stupid enough to drop off in Sweden for some medical treatment. And there he encountered something called universal jurisdiction, i.e. Sweden can try people for certain crimes, even if they got no connection to Sweden. And guess where that man is now? Serving life. Hey ho. So people's tribunals can do quite good things, as it happens. I then did another one of these, uh, <coughs> serving as a judge when I didn't want to serve as a judge, because <coughs> I thought I'd be far better off to them serving as a as a uh, an advisor on procedure. But in the way, it was a good thing I became a judge. Now, this had to do with, this is a test, by the way, there are now six of you there, so it's hands shooting up when you tell me what was the massacre that happened in 1965, where a million people and more were killed in horrifying circumstances? Hands up, please. This is the class. All right, no answers. We don't know about things because our governments hide them from us. In the handover of, of control from, was it Sakano to Sahato or the other way around? Um, in uh, Indonesia at that time, there was a handover from, or, or rather a takeover from a communist government by a non-communist government. And guess which countries supported the takeover? Well, it was Britain and America. That's why you don't know about it. There's a million people and the butchering of them was utterly horrifying. I don't advise you to watch the films made about it featuring the perpetrators unless you didn't eat for several days, maybe. I mean, it is really pretty shocking. But what was good for me about the really good lesson I learned from this tribunal, where I'd been made to be a judge, was what the judges did. Now, here, again, the presiding judge was a, a South African Supreme Court judge in retirement, a very famous judge because he's blind. Other lawyers, there was also a journalist and other people, but they were experts. And so we heard the evidence in this very grand place in The Hague and retired to deliberate. And when we deliberated, the lawyers, not me, but all the others, were completely partisan. They argued the case. They didn't assess the evidence. They were committed. They wanted a result. And I was 
apart from being mildly shocked and therefore withdrawing from the final process, I realised, that which didn't come as a surprise to me, because I'm sorry, I don't think that much of lawyers, that lawyers are simply not to be trusted. They do a job, but they're not necessarily good people or bad people. They're just people. And when they find themselves engaged, they get carried away. And so that was interesting for me. Um, oh, by the way, you always, no, I don't say that. They haven't got time. How are we doing? Not badly. So, <laughs> so I now had some experience. I had the good experience of Iran and I had the, the learning curve of um, the Indonesian tribunal. And it was, it was terribly well-intentioned. The people who put it on knew lots and lots of stuff, but it was hopelessly presented. And I believe the judgment, although I, I didn't eventually really stand behind it, uh, I believe it's actually had some good effect in Indonesia. But so now I had a plan <coughs> for what would happen if, if anybody ever wanted one of these things done. And in, I suppose, about 2017, I'm not sure, I was, I was asked by somebody I've been doing various pro bono stuff with, whether I'd write an opinion for a group of people called the Falun Gong. Anybody know who the Falun Gong are? They stand outside the embassy of the People's Republic of China in just up from Oxford Circus, and they they and they're also in Chinatown. But you don't know who they are. What happens to them? Um, well, it's pretty unfortunate what happens to them. Um, starting in about the 1960s and 1970s, the People's Republic of China, starting the process of developing uh, organ transplants. And what they did was, and they first of all used organ transplants to keep the old fossils who were running the country going for a bit longer. And they got the organs out of prisoners. So that was quite easy. So uh, they had a policy of killing lots of people uh, by way of capital punishment and then cutting them open, ripping them up and taking out their organs. And indeed, there's some wonderful testimony, if you can stand it, from a bloke called Enver Totti, who describes exactly how it was done, because they didn't actually kill the people. When he went out on a, on a, on a, ra on a party, a confidential party, to collect, to collect a body for organs, uh, in, in sort of in the dawn of an execution, uh, all the all the prisoners were lined up kneeling against the grave uh, and they were all shot in the back of the head except the one they were going to have to take back to the ambulance cut open and relieve of his kidney heart um eyes and everything else and he was shot here because i martin you'll be able to tell me if i've got this right if you get shot there you don't die immediately and that means that you can thereafter be it's much easier to whip the organs out and pop them in the relevant cold boxes and get them off to the hospitals you want. So that's how it was done. And the Falun Gong being a very, uh, a very, very dangerous group. Um, I hope I haven't got any uh, Falun Gong practitioners here, but there are those who might say some of their beliefs are a bit strange, but they are forbearance and forgiveness. They are not violent. Their greatest violence is to do public exercises, um, uh, waving their arms around a bit and trying to get fit. They don't smoke, they don't drink. So guess what? They got really good organs. And so what happened was they became so popular as a group in China at the end of the last century that China, having supported them for a time, suddenly turned against them because they, they would be dangerous for communism, which requires not forbearance and forgiveness, but requires violence as part of the natural process of running a country. <coughs> and so they started locking them up in large numbers. And since when they were being locked up, they knew that uh, the policy of China would be go to go back to their villages and take it out on their families. They stripped themselves of all identifying material. So China had a nice bank of completely anonymous, non-smoking, non-drinking, healthy people to cut open and rip out their organs. And so they've been doing that since the turn of the last century, uh, the turn of this century. And it's been the subject of evidence given to the committees in the United States uh, um, Congress since 2001. And it's been the subject of evidence everywhere around the, um, the West and indeed in our country. But, well, 
we liked China, didn't we? And so if you read the parliamentary debates of what was going on, you'd have some well, well intending um, Commons MP like Fiona Bruce or uh, Shannon or, or a member of the House of Lords like David Orton or Helena Kennedy, and they'd, they'd wag their finger at the government and say, you've got to do something about this. And the government would say, oh, dear, this is very sad and very concerning, but the evidence isn't quite good enough, so we'll do nothing. And so that was the position in which the, those working for the Falun Gong found themselves. And they said, would I write an opinion uh, about all this and say whether well, crimes had been committed? And I said, well, that'd be a bit of a waste of time. Nobody would read it. It certainly wouldn't make it as an op-ed anywhere. And had they thought of a people's tribunal? And they thought that was a thunderingly bad idea. And you can see exactly why. Because NGOs believe in their cause. They already knew the answer. They didn't need some newcomer, let alone some new body, to come along and bring in a result, the answer to which was entirely obvious. <coughs> but eventually, because they couldn't cut through, they asked me to make a, a former tribunal. And to give you an idea of how impressive they are, the NGO concerned was not just a collection of Falun Gongers, because they're so peaceful. They, they're not likely to do this sort of thing. There are some Falun Gong practitioners in the NGO, but this is a, a leading um, uh, human rights lawyer from Canada, uh, an investigative journalist, and he's now dead, but an absolutely lovely man who looks like and has the street cred of David Attenborough. And he was a former Secretary of State for Canada called David Kilgore. I mean, these are people of complete integrity and they couldn't get through to their governments. And so I set up that tribunal and I set it up now as much as I could on the basis of having non-specialists, non-lawyers, non-judges as the judges, just people. And I didn't want an adversarial system because that does, doesn't do any good at all. I wanted it to be an inquiry where we call evidence in public, looked for evidence favorable to China and so on and so forth. And we brought in the result and we found that China was guilty of crimes against humanity and torture. But it, this was still in the period of Cameron's golden age of China, so it cut no mustard in England. But you'll be arguably pleased to know that in the long period of the time that's passed since 2019, when we delivered judgment in that case, it um, has cut, a, it's, it's been very effective, not least, Martin may be able to confirm, with medical, uh, medical professional associations around the world who will no longer allow academic papers from China, which is at the forefront of transplantation surgery, unless the whole process of um, uh, voluntary transplant of the organ to use of the organ in, in and so on. So it's had a lot of effect and it's led to uh, bills being passed in the American Congress. So that's been very effective. And after that was done, where we discovered that the Uyghurs were also being used for organ transplant harvesting. And by the way, a single cadaver can a single cadaver cadaver can make you about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You've got so many bits that are reusable, so it's quite good for their business. And they've got loads and loads of hospitals. Anyway, so that then we learned about the Uyghurs. And I was asked to um, <coughs> another bloke who'd been on the China Tribunal, I was asked to set up a tribunal for the Uyghurs. And now I was able to do it in exactly the way I wanted. So we had absolutely no specialists as judges. The previous tribunal, the NGO had wanted lawyers and stuff like that. We had one or two. Now we had almost no lawyers and I didn't count myself as a lawyer. I behaved just like a juryman. And we had nine and you can look up, look them up on the website. Professors of this, that and the other thing a businessman, a former diplomat, one retired city solicitor, but who's been doing things like chairing water aid. So we had a high level jury who had absolutely no interest in the Uyghurs. And that was quite important. And it was all done in public in church house. And we now had material to suggest genocide. And I've just about got time to deal with genocide and I haven't dealt with all the other things I wanted to deal with. And you haven't asked any questions and I haven't finished my drink. So one way or another, we've got a whole lot to get through. But <coughs> here, um, 
it was very interesting because much of uh, we were very careful in the evidence we uh, accepted. Uh, we did not accept the rather large number of other reports prepared by Amnesty Human Rights Watch, bunches of lawyers and all sorts of other things, making very strong decisions against China. But we did find uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes, uh, sorry, torture, and one of the five forms of possible criminal genocide proved, one only. And guess what? Things had changed. We are now out of the golden age of Cameron's China or China, Cameron's golden age. And we're now into the period where everyone hates China. And uh, so there was a lot of short term support for the Uyghurs. Remember again, there was a time when you remembered the North Koreans. There was a time when you remembered the 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 the, we, uh, the uh, Rohingya Muslims and so on and so forth. You've forgotten them all now. But this was a time when everybody remembered the Uyghurs. So we actually had to be careful of the strong following wind and make sure we were super cautious, which we were. And so that judgment came out almost exactly two years ago, finding um, genocide. <coughs> And you are, I hope, interested to know that since then, I've tried to get the British government to accept our findings, and they don't. But I'm having a last major go now, because next Tuesday or Monday is the 70th anniversary of the founding of the Genocide Convention. And so there'll be some events where I'll be able to speak to the Foreign Secretary, maybe. And I've sent him a long public letter explaining the error of his ways. So that's the sort of stuff I've been doing. And uh, there was lots of other things I wanted to talk about. But I want to say something about genocide. And I want to say something about Russia, Ukraine and Israel, Gaza. So I'll come back to genocide uh, because I really think it's important. Um, uh, this is not none of this is in my book, the last bit. Some of the stuff about people's tribunals is, but... Uh, but not all of it. But uh, the Ukraine war started after, um, after, well after my book was published. And it is an extraordinary um, failure by the West that we allowed this situation to develop and this land grab war to happen. How can we have been so, so how can we have been so hopeless that this developed? How did we not try and stop things at, at the time of Crimea in 2014, 15. And we are now facing a really disturbing future because one land grab war here, as everybody is fearing, may lead to a facsimile or repetition uh, in Taiwan and so on. And as we find that parts of the world do not support the Western position of defeat Russia at any cost and charge, then we may have things to worry about. And we know that people are talking about nuclear war again, whereas they hadn't been for the last 30 years. You're probably most of you remember the time of shelters and civil defense all gone. We've forgotten about it. We've lived in a time of phony peace and it's all changed. And so what is Russia, Ukraine going to do about the, the number of um, cases they've got? I've, been there a few times in the last year and I know the people who run the war crimes department quite well and they've got 130,000 cases already that they are investigating and as you think about it you realize those cases even if there's a mechanism can not be tried it isn't possible it isn't possible. And you then have to ask a few other questions. Have war crimes trials in the past ever stopped the next warmonger? Probably not. There's no evidence that Nuremberg stopped anyone. Or even that the you know, Yugoslav tribunal stopped anyone. It doesn't work. Warmonger leader, leaders need something else. And we don't know what it is. But here in Ukraine, there is at least a possibility, I don't know, and I am encouraging them to do this, to think broadly and radically and to think not just of what they need to achieve vis-a-vis -vis Russia for a future, but what they can do by way of accountability for war crimes 
in order to help us not have to face, or rather our children and grandchildren not have to face too many wars in the future. One of the things that I've explained to the Ukrainians that, that came as a surprise, but in some ways a welcome surprise to them is, for goodness sake, don't let the internationals run your accountability process. Because for all the reasons I've already given, it's almost bound to be the subject of interference by uh, big power politics from outside, and that they're far better off actually trying to deal with all these matters themselves. I can expand on that if we had more time, but we don't. Um, but that's interesting to think about, because especially now that the, tr that the trial, uh, the war is not one sided, but seems to be uh, locked or blocked. What's going to happen for an accountability process for this war that will not only solve the problem for the miserably unhappy people on both sides of the border, either the, the bereaved or the thousands of people who are going to be wandering around for the next 50, 60, 70 years on crutches, bringing to light to the survivors on either side how ghastly this war was. It's a really, really difficult problem. Israel Gaza is something else I got involved with <laughs> twice. And on each occasion, my involvement ended when I declined to say to the client concerned that Benjamin Netanyahu was a war criminal. Not because I didn't think he might be a war criminal, not because there wasn't evidence to say that he might be a war criminal, but because there wasn't enough evidence. But what's um, what's important about this, something for you to, to think, it, think about, and I'll, I'll sketch it out as quickly as I can. The first matter I was involved with, it happened in 2010, <laughs> when there was a... Um, a convoy of vessels containing medicine, food and other stuff, a flotilla, sorry, working its way towards Gaza to break the blockade and to take humanitarian aid to the people of Gaza. And it was headed by a ship called the Mavi Mamara, which was the biggest vessel, which was a passenger ferry or something. And as it steamed its way south to walk from Turkey towards uh, possibly towards Gaza, but more probably towards Egypt, where the stuff would have been offloaded. The Israeli Air Force dr or helicopters dropped some, roped some men down who shot some people on the boat. Now, Israel is not a member of the International Criminal Court. Ha ha. Therefore, it's not subject to the jurisdiction of the International Court. Ho ho. But in fact, it is. Because when the Mavi Mamara set sail, I don't know why, but it chose to fly the flag of the Isles of Comoros. And you all know where the Isles of Comoros is. And if you don't like me, you'll have looked it up on the Atlas. It's the northeast coast of, of Africa. But it, it is a member of the ICC. And the law of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is, is that if you commit crime on a boat or airplane, then it's pretty much like committing a crime on the territory. So the ICC had jurisdiction. And so there was efforts made by the man on behalf of the people who'd been killed to take this, to force the ICC to take this case. And to say that they were grudging would be an understatement. To say that they were slow would be, uh, or slow as a tortoise, would be to understate something or other. They moved glacially. Were they being pressed by the Americans on behalf of Israel to do nothing? I have no evidence to prove that, and therefore I couldn't possibly say that, could I? But think about this. And eventually, by the way, the prosecutor decided that what the evidence wasn't severe enough. There were only about half a dozen people killed for her court. But that doesn't matter to me. They could have got involved earlier. And you may or may not remember what happened in 2014. But in 2014 was the last war between Israel and Gaza, the last big one, before this one. They happened at about five yearly intervals normally. It's something that is known by the nickname of mowing the grass on the Israeli side, I think. <laughs> and you've got to consider what might have happened if, and in, the, in Operation Pr Protective Edge, which was the 2014 war, um, about 500 children were killed, I think. Uh, I'm not sure, 1,500 people altogether on the Palestine side. 
what might have happened if the ICC had got stuck in in 2012, 2013 and said, yeah, yeah, we're a court. We'll take this seriously. But it didn't. And the op and Operation Protective Edge happened. I then got involved a, a second time and I went to Gaza just after Protective Edge about nine years ago. Now, Operation Protective Edge, unlike the, the recent one, was arguably uh, ambiguous or uncertain about who was the starter of the violence. It was said to be Hamas by killing three young people, but that wasn't quite clear. And so uh, in Gaza in December 14, I met and indeed interviewed uh, Ishmael Hanea, the political head of Hamas, and I have the transcript of the interview. And I said to him, what do you think about the International Criminal Court? And he said, yes, please. I want, I want the International Criminal Court to get involved. And you could see why he might say that, because this one looked as though there might be sympathy for the Palestinians, rather more merited than it would be if you just look at what happened on the 7th of October. And on the following year, <laughs> the Palestinian Authority uh, granted jurisdiction to the ICC as it was able to do in respect of the West Bank and of Gaza. And the same question arises. How long did it take the International Criminal Court eventually to say that it had jurisdiction for these matters and was America or somebody else uh, standing on the break? It took them eight years. Supposing in this terrible tragedy, the rather weak International Criminal Court had got stuck in in 2015, 16, 17, and required evidence, even if Israel wouldn't have cooperated, even if the Hamas leaders would not have been able to be found, supposing it had taken seriously what its function was, might the inadequate and incomplete international legal order have stopped this last war? Something to think about, isn't it? And it just shows you what a fragile international and weak international order we have. I said I was going to say something about genocide, but I've only got seven minutes if Isabel cuts me off on time. So I'll stop now and come back to genocide. And have you got any questions? And I'm sorry I've talked so fast. Jeffrey, Go I, wouldn't, on. I, I wouldn't cut you off. I wouldn't cut you off. I've got a question for you, actually. You mentioned um, when I was sort of listening to you at the beginning, um, with all the sort of evidence you were sort of mentioning being withheld or the transcript this and the transcript that, it reminded me of the Nuremberg trial with Klaus Barbie, the tapes that were sort of kept in Bolivia and, and other sort of instances. Now, how do you explain that the Nuremberg trial was set up so quickly after the war and is still spoken about now and everybody knows about it, which is not the case for all the other tribunals. Is that because it was at the, at the end of a, of a world war as opposed to a national conflict? How do you explain why we haven't learned from the Nuremberg trial more? Well, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm going to ask Martin to help me out because he being exactly my age and stage in the school, he may or may not be able to confirm something I'm about to tell you. The Nuremberg trials were as quick as they were because we had all the documents. So although it was still a run according to the absurd British adversarial system where you have prosecution and defense, neither of whom may tell, be, be telling the truth, but they're in there for a game to win. They had all the documents. They had so many documents. In fact, the public gallery kept getting empty and that's why they called witnesses, so it is sometimes said, to live it up to drag the people back in. Um, <clears throat> but over 20 people tried in less than a year. Um, so why is it remembered? Well, one of the reasons is the pictures. And I've tried this occasionally in lectures. You flash a picture of the Nuremberg trial and say, okay, who knows this picture? Oh, like that. And more or less everybody does. And it's an example of the power of the image. If you put up an image of the Indonesian conflict, nothing. Put up an, a, a, a picture of the Iran conflict, nothing. And, the, and on the other hand, if you put up an image of the little girl in the Vietnam conflict, 
quite a good memory recall. Images are very, very powerful, and that's one thing they had. The other thing was that it was a definitive trial. You didn't have to muck about. It was a year, and it reinforced the absolute victory of, uh, of the Allies in that war. But now coming to Martin Mace, who's going to speak to us, um, <coughs> it took me years to understand something of real importance. So I went to this really awful school on Stansted Road, but it thought it was all right. And um, it had a certain level of intelligence and people could string two words together. And then because we had a very good maths master who got us in a, a completely privileged position over all other schools, I got into a good university I wouldn't have done otherwise. And then I went off and became a sort of incompetent lawyer. So I did three bits of learning in the course of which, and at school before that, in the course of which never once did we ever discuss the war? Can you think of that? Martin, am I right? No answer. Martin, am I right? Need, we never discussed you, the war. You need to unmute yourself at the top, Martin, on the mic at the top of your screen. Thumbs up if you agree with, with you, Martin. I don't. <laughs> um, Jeff, I completely understand it. What we've got to add to that, however, I think, is that, I mean, uh, for, for instance, my father, as I reached the sort of middle school, St. Dunstan's, he was only 12 years since he'd had a dreadful war. And I think they wanted to forget about it because they won it. Um, and he wouldn't, he would, I mean, if I asked him, he wouldn't speak about it. Um, well, that's another, that's, that's part of the reason. I, I accept that, Martin. It may be part of the reason for some people. My mum and dad had a Londoners war, like everyone else, bombs falling and, and you know, going and looking at the craters afterwards. But your father, I suspect, had a much more active and unpleasant, uh, unpleasant war. But here's another way of looking at the same problem. Look at the films we watched in 1945, 6, 7, 8, 9, 50, 51, 2, 3, 4, 5. You'll find no serious war films. One or two films where England won the war alone in black and white, and then occasionally in colour, but nothing serious. And the first time we started thinking about the Holocaust seriously in films and in conversation for me was in 1982 with Shoah which is a film, if none of you have seen it, you should. And that is a most extraordinary film. And now suddenly we were awake to it. So we'd had 30 years of just looking forward. The Beatles took over the world 19 years after the end of World War II. And none of their songs, so far as I know, is about World War II. If you go to the Balkans, where they've had war crimes that are not resolved, because they'd lasted 30 years, how absurd is that? And they're still not resolved, not least because America and other countries are keeping evidence back and because the process was ludicrously slow to enable the lawyers and judges to make heaps of money or so they mm -hmm. thought. Um, where you go there now, if you go now out of Bosnia, anybody been to Bosnia recently? Bosnia and spoken to the Bosnian Muslims. Lovely people, lovely country. Everybody loves it. And they're all trying to leave the country because they've got no future. And what are their conversations about? What are their films about? What are their plays about? What are their books about? They're all about the war. And so you're left with arguably, and I know this is all rapidly condensed, contentious material, uh, and, and tendentious too, but you're left with the possibility that early resolution of the war, either by total defeat and or by the assistance of a short, sharp, trial with a quick few hangings at the end of it and lots of good pictures enables people to look forward as we did martin in our own way never looking back and i never looked back until i was forced to confront the film show and realize how empty my knowledge was yes yeah yeah gosh shams you've got a question Yes, thank you, Isabel, and thank you, Jeffrey, for an amazing uh, talk to us. Um, in, in, in terms of your point about images and going back to the Second World War, 
if you fast track to today and you see the harrowing images coming out of initially Israel and now Gaza, Palestine, do you, and, and also given the impact of social media by which images simply cannot be kept out, how do you see that impacting on, on the long term, on, on, on any long term resolution of this conflict or accountability? I don't know that I do see it because I don't know that I've got any more foresight than anybody else. But I suspect, and this may be the purpose of your question, that uh, oversupply may dilute the effect of any single one. And that therefore we may not have the benefit, if it is, of the picture of Nuremberg or the picture of the little girl at Vietnam being an immediate trigger to a complex memory. Because um, if you look back to the Second World War, and I'm sure we've all done this, there are a number of images that might work for you in a nasty way. Um, one is the um, bulldoze and the bodies of either Belson or Auschwitz, probably Auschwitz. That's a pretty strong image. But I still think it's the picture of the trial that most people tend to remember most easily. And it's because they're limited in number that they they trigger whatever the internal process of recollection is. The process of recollection in the individual would be different according to whether she or he is an academic, a reader, or, or somebody who takes a very primitive or simple-minded view of the conflict. But I think if this was what you were suggesting, may, oversub, may oversupply dilute effect? I think the answer may be yes. Now, whether that means we'll have to become more thoughtful because we won't be able to make a simple look decision against America over the little girl and the, whatever she was affected by. I think she was burnt, wasn't she? With, was she burnt with the palm or I can't remember? I think so. Um, yeah, no, I think so. Hmm. No, oh, Hiroshima is another example. But yes, <coughs> um, if I got that wrong, then correct me. I'm sorry, but I thought the little girl was Vietnam. Maybe, sorry. I think, yeah, I think it is. Um, so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling now. And there's another question. So I'll let the question take over and stop my ramble. <laughs> yes. Uh, the chap. Uh, in, Nick. Yeah. You, you're on unmute, please. Can you type your question in the chat box? Because you don't seem to be connected. If you type it, I'll read it out. OK, um, I think he was probably helping me with my ignorance and getting to say I got the right answer. But I think it's a really interesting question that one way or another you raise. And it's, and it's part of a bigger question that's arriving with these last two wars. Um, because you've heard in the last eight weeks something you've never heard on television or radio before, the word proportionality. Nobody knew that you had to assess the criminality of a, of a, of a military defense or action according to whether it was proportionate. And now you suddenly heard it. And slowly and slowly, uh, as, as I suppose um, the smallest of possible benefits out of these horrors is that the public is becoming better informed. And so if you can't have um, a simple trigger by a picture because we've got too many pictures. If that's going to be the case, then perhaps we're going to balance it out by a bit more information. And that's why I do want to talk about genocide, but let's see if there are, and I know I've overrun, but I'm going to talk about it. And it won't take very long to make the point, but are there any other questions? <coughs> I'm just reading out just quickly that Nick, has confirmed that the little girl was burned by napalm attack on her village in Vietnam. So my apologies for talking about Hiroshima. Not at all. Thank you. Of course, Hiroshima has got an absolutely perfect uh, image, which we all know. Um, and that's enough for that. And very few pictures on the ground. <laughs> and a devastating article in the London Review of Books last fortnight uh, raising again the argument that there was never any need for Hiroshima and that the Japanese were already about to surrender or could have been made to surrender. And the proportionality argument advanced 
uh, by the Secretary of State at the time and by the President Truman was simply unjustified, horrifying if true. Why I want to say talk about genocide is because genocide is being talked about, and uh, genocide has two meanings. It has the, the public meaning and it has the legal meaning. And the public are absolutely not to be blamed for <coughs> um, using it in, in an informal way, which is inaccurate, meaning mass murder, uh, and not coming to grips with the legal meaning. And the reason they're not remotely to be blamed is because governments have avoided the legal meaning for 70 years. And they've avoided the legal meaning because of what they agreed to when they signed the Genocide Convention in 19, whatever it was, 52, and ratified it later. And it's quite important now, particularly, for example, with respect to the Uyghurs, genocide is a crime that comes about if an individual or a body, a government, is possessed of a certain thinking process. And the thinking process is the desire to destroy another part of society, identified as a group of religious or ethnic or whatever else it might be. It's quite limited. But what it comes to, I've argued, and I've indeed been pressing on the foreign secretary, <coughs> is what it comes to is the people at the end of the Second World War realized that having seen what happened at Auschwitz and so on, that humanity cannot continue if one part of humanity decides it wants to attack another part of humanity simply because of who that other part of humanity is. Whether it's Armenians or Jews or Bosnian Muslims or whoever else in the accepted genocides. And you can see why that's so important. Humanity is single. And once you start going down the route of saying, well, it's it's all right if this bit of humanity would like to dispose of that bit of humanity because we get better trade. Come on now, that, that's a slippery slope and you should not even think of going down there. And the problem for governments has been that when the genocide convention was hammered out by reluctant people, but they were people who'd seen two world wars and in particular, they'd seen the second world war and they were driven by this man Raphael Lemkin <coughs> devised the first form of the term genocide. They realized that they had to stop us doing this. And they then identified five ways in ge which genocide can be committed, only one of which is mass killing. And the others are um, conditions of life and harming people. And the last two, one is interfering with births and one is transferring of children. And that is so important for the public to begin to understand that you don't, <coughs> you don't need to go in. First of all, mass killing may not be genocide. It may be, but it may not be. It's only going to be genocide if those doing it are seized of this horrifying wish of one part of humanity to destroy another part or one individual to destroy a part of humanity simply because they're Jews or Armenians or whoever. <coughs> so. Um, in the case of the Uyghurs, although lots of other bodies uh, in a very expansive way, 17 parliaments around the world and the United States as a government found genocide in very general terms, we only found genocide proved in the Uyghur tribunal on the basis of interfering with the births of Uyghurs. And if you interfere with births by uh, forcing uh, determinations at the moment of birth, killing babies just after they've been born, and all the sorts of things that were evidenced in the Uyghur tribunal. If you do that, if you reduce the future population of the group of Uyghurs and you carry on doing that, then of course you start destroying them as a group. And you can also see why transferring children, which we did not find but might have done, is really, really serious as a crime because you take children from a group, Uyghurs, but it could be Jews or it could be Bosnian Muslims, and you move them to another community, you deprive them of their language, you insist on their speaking another language and learning another culture, you, you, you terminate that, or you start the process of destroying and terminating 
the, the group from which they came. And humanity must not do that. And so the problem is that Article 1 of the Genocide Convention says to all, part all contracting party parties, uh, <coughs> I've got the wrong term, sorry, that they must, and the law now has said, the instant they know of genocide, they must act to prevent or punish it. And it doesn't matter whether it happens on the far side of the world or in Belgium or the Netherlands or the Republic of Ireland, our immediate neighbors. They must act. And that's why governments will never respond to the Genocide Convention. And why, despite the fact that the Uyghur Tribunal found in a very cautious conservative judgment, this one form of genocide, two years of governments have declined even to say whether they accept or reject it. Do you know what the British government's explanation is and reasoning is? It's wonderful. And Lewis Carroll is not a member of parliament. He's dead. But what they say is, aha, genocide can only ever be decided by a judge. There's no law that tells them to say that. They just made it up. But then they say, but, oh dear, there's no judge. There's no judge who has the jurisdiction to make that determination, so the determination can't be made. That is literally what your government, our government, <coughs> is very determined on the last few years to do. And that's what I'm trying to, at the moment, try and um, stop them not doing. But the concept is really important, I think. And to be used very cautiously, because where it arises, it's not a psychiatric condition that <coughs> arises from birth or for some other reason. It's a condition into which people talk themselves or are talked by others, leaders like um, Hitler maybe and, and all sorts of others, where you as part of humanity want to destroy another part of humanity. And where that happens, you have got to be stopped. And I suppose, I've got to be stopped too. <laughs>